All right, I think it is all Roberts. Okay, well, hey, everyone, thanks for uh, your participation so far. It's, I think it's been a great conference so far, and we're only a quarter of the way through it. And so it's mostly uh, to a great benefit for all of you who are participating. Thanks for coming back to this session. Uh, we're now going to have the great pleasure of hearing from uh, one of the founders of this whole concept here, Lynn Nilsson. And I just want to uh, <clears throat> give a few shouts out before uh, we, we get going. We are recording this particular session, this webinar, so that will be posted later and the slides will be available later so you can review them. And uh, we'd like to give a shout out again to our uh, sponsor, College Bridge. Uh, they've been very, very generous, very supportive of this entire conference, both this year and last year. So thank you, College Bridge, for helping us out here. And where we are currently in the schedule is we're, again, having a keynote, and then we'll take a little break once we're done with the keynote, and then have some parallel sessions in the afternoon and wrap up day one and get ready for day two coming up very, very soon. It was going by fast, isn't it? So I'm very happy to, uh, to introduce Linda Nilsson to you. And when we were first putting together a mastery grading conference, uh, 2019, I believe it was, we kicked around the idea of keynote speakers. Who could we bring in who would be an inspiration to us and give us the literally the key note so we could tune ourselves to uh, what we ought to be doing, give us uh, something to look uh, ahead toward. And the very first name that came up was Linda Nilsson. Uh, Linda is an internationally known keynote speaker, workshop designer, leader, one of the one of the uh, all-time greats of faculty development. She's a founding director and director emerita of the Office of Teaching Effectiveness and Innovation at Clemson. Uh, before she was at Clemson, she was at Vanderbilt University leading the Center for Teaching, which is where I first met Linda. I worked for her uh, and she was a great boss and a great mentor and a friend for, for there and ever since. She's the author of many books on college teaching, uh, many research articles and uh, articles in academic career development, including of course the classic specifications, grading, restoring rigor, motivating students, and saving faculty time. So uh, Linda, it's great that you're here, and I'm very uh, pleased uh, to have you uh, speak to us now. This is an honor and a thrill to be here, and I'm so happy that this conference is going on, and it's going on not just for the first year, but for the second year, and maybe it, maybe it'll keep going. I hope it keeps going for absolutely ever, because uh, you know, the, the beauty of, of mastery grading, what I'm going to be talking about today, which is, which is specifications grading, and why I love it so much, is because it gives you back your life, or at least it can give you back your life. And uh, because it, so often as a faculty member, we lose track of our own lives. They're too crowded with our jobs. So anyway, so specifications grading. Let's get into it. These are the outcomes for you, what you're going to be able to do um, after this session is over. You're going to be able to articulate criteria for evaluating a grading system. Bet you never thought about those before. And use these to critically evaluate our predominant grading system, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. You're going to be able to distinguish types of mastery grading. Now, as, as I see them, as I interpret them, as, as, as I've learned them, uh, you're going to be able to explain how this new grading system, specifications grading or specs grading, how it works. And if you choose, you'll be able to implement the system in whole or in part in your courses. The nice thing, it's very flexible and you can take different parts of it and put it into your course or put it into your uh, different parts of uh, putting into your course at different at, for different grade levels. So there are a lot of different possibilities here. So let's look at the criteria of an ideal grading system. And by the way, this is these are not all of them. I had to, to drop a couple. Uh, one of them had to do with discouraging uh, cheating. And the other one had to do with rewarding uh, higher level thinking and creative thinking as well. Uh, so anyway, but these, these we're going to be looking at in some detail and using them to evaluate our own grading system, which we know, by the way, the traditional grading system, which uh, obviously does not discourage cheating. So anyway, now criteria of an I, I, uh, ideal grading system, I put at the top, 
upholds high academic standards. And during, during uh, Josh Eiler's talk this morning, we were having a big discussion about in the chat about uh, rigor and what it is and what it isn't. And there was a, a lot of disagreements because, you know, rigor mortis, right? You know, so, well, that means rigidity. It means, it means uh, death. Uh, but it just, you know, it's, it's, it's a bad thing. Well, to me, rigor is high academic standards and upholding those. And I want to make an argument to you about the importance of rigor. Um, a few years ago, a new book came out, Amanda Ripley's The Smartest Kids in the World and How They Got That Way. And it was Simon and Schuster put it out. And she was looking at K through 12 systems around the world and also trying to figure out why, why some countries' systems were rising in the ratings and the rankings of achievement and others were faltering, others were falling. So the ones that were rising and really hitting the top were Finland, South Korea, and Poland. And one of the ones that was slipping was the United States. And, you know, what she found, she wanted to find out, okay, why is this happening? And in her analysis, she identified rigor as the main factor, the main um, explaining variable. And she found that uh, the American uh, system had, had been losing rigor in teaching, textbooks, and grading, all three of those. So I look at rigor as a, uh, a matter of national security. I really do. So I really think it's, it's important. But anyway, but other criteria for an ideal grading system. Uh, Grades should reflect students' achievement of outcomes. They certainly don't now. Students should know what's expected of them, right? That the, the system should motivate students to learn and do excellent work. It should make students feel responsible for their grades. It should minimize student-faculty conflict, like grading protests, right? Uh, minimize uh, student-faculty stress. It should give students feedback that they use. And it should save you time, folks, it give you your life back. And it should also um, foster high inter-rater agreement, right? So our grades don't look capricious. Well, so let's do a little poll. So on which criteria does our current grading system perform well? And I want you to select all that apply. And it's just the criteria that you just saw. Same criteria. Where does our system perform well? Multiple, multiple choice. <laughs> you should be able to vote on the poll. The poll is anonymous as well. Oh, yeah. We getting any results yet? We are. Um, we have about 130 results so far out of 305. We're seeing in the chat, why don't we have a none of the above option? Uh, that is an issue. We, we only had two choices <laughs> in the Zoom. We, had, yes. we should have probably put that one in. <laughs> yeah, right. OK, yeah, that's, uh, that's fair. We're about 55% uh, have voted so far. OK, OK, good, good, good. Give it a few more, maybe about 30 more seconds to get people in. Yeah. Okay, we've got about 200 out of 300 plus a lot of comments in the chat that they wanted the none of the above. Oh, so okay, okay. Well. We'll count your none of the above from the chat. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go ahead. Yeah, I never thought of none of the above. Certainly, we must have been doing something well for the past, I guess, 150 years or so, but maybe not. <laughs> okay, I'll go ahead and close the poll and share the results. Okay, great. Oh, 
Okay. <laughs> well, okay, see, it's not all is lost. Uh, but it's what my my eye went to first minimize minimize the student and faculty stress. I guess our system, our traditional system, hasn't been doing that very well, or minimizing student faculty conflict, right? So uh, that's uh, that's sobering. Um, it makes students feel responsible for their grades if 40% say it's, it's been doing that. So, oh, here's another one that we haven't been doing very well on. Foster's high iterator agreement. 5% said that our system did that well. Fascinating, fascinating. Okay, all right, fine. Let's go on to the next poll. Okay, on uh, which criteria uh, does our current grading system perform poorly? And if anybody has a none of the above option, I don't know what you're doing here. So, uh, <laughs> so it's the same same criteria. Oh, stop, 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 stop. There's a problem with the poll. Hold on, let me fix it. Okay. We're gonna relaunch that. That was my mistake. I'm gonna fix it right now, one second. Uh, edits. Uh, Donna, you can reassess poll launching at this I, time if you would like to. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's poll creation that's the problem, not not poll launching. Because uh -huh. I made it a, um, oh, come on, let me edit this. Hold on. Although the one that we performed the poorest on, I mean, the top choice there would also be interesting. I wonder if we would all agree about that. Okay, it's not going to let me fix it very easily. Oh, give me one sec. I can do something. Okay, but keep talking because it will take me a second. Okay, okay. Um, well, what I can do is start talking about the next slide that you don't have to see yet, but it's about different kinds of mastery grading. Well, actually, I can show you that slide, I suppose. Uh, types of master grading, contract grading, standards-based grading, and specs grading. Uh, and you know we're, what we're flirting around with here is the notion of competency-based education as well. But that's on a program level um, versus a course level. And what we're talking about here, you know, we're looking at courses and we're looking at what we can control. So we're still going to be submitting A's, B's, C's, B's, whatever. Uh, because we don't want to lose our jobs. And uh, frankly, we don't really have the time to lead a revolution. So for now, okay, we're just going to, we're, we're, we're going to stay within certain parameters of uh, that the, the institutions require. But anyway, um, contract grading is something that, as, as my understanding of it, it started in the 60s, and these were individual contracts were hammered out between the professor and the student. So it was a little bit like an independent study, even if it was under a, a course umbrella. So that's what it was. Well, contract grading is actually uh, forbidden at some universities because what happened was that there were no clear standards. And faculty at that point hadn't thought about setting clear standards. So it was pretty much a free for all. And so anything that students handed in, the faculty member didn't have any criteria on which to say, no, it doesn't get an A. So that's why it got a very, very bad reputation and uh, increased grading inflation. Then there's standards-based grading. Oh, is I can it down? do the poll whenever you're ready, yes. Okay, okay, I'll just, just go through this. Standards-based grading, I've, uh, when I first learned about it, it was a K through 12 thing, but I've seen it sort of now integrated in, into higher education. And what it seems to mean from what I can gather is that you students will do an assignment or a test as many times as it takes to show mastery. And um, that's quite different from specs grading, which gives you a quite a limited number of times 
to redo something to get it right. So that's a that's a very major difference. And by the way, specs grading, there's no contracts. This is the way the course is. You set it up and students have to work within uh, within that that framework. So uh, but competency based education, that is something where you you show that you've achieved outcomes. So let's go back to this poll. OK, what criteria does our current grading system do poorly? Hopefully it's working now. OK, there we go. Yes, that's better. Oh, good, good, good. Wonderful. People definitely are happy to respond to this one. Uh, okay, nobody's looking for a none of the above. No, no. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay. <laughs> uh, 68% have voted so far. Okay. <laughs> some people want to check some of these things twice. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, I can't wait to see. Got about, let's give it about 10 more seconds. We're starting to slow down on the participation. All right, let's see how we did this time. Oh, wow, wow, these, these are some big numbers. Okay, I love this, minimize the student family stress, it does terribly on it also over the conflict. Uh, so yeah, um, oh my, yeah, it's, they sure, uh, grades don't reflect students' achievement of outcomes. Students, well, some of you believe that students know what's expected of them, but you know that really, really falls on on us. Uh, motivate students to learn and do excellent work. Mm, not so hot there. Uh, okay, well, yeah, and it certainly doesn't save faculty time, does it? No, 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 no. We spend a good deal of our time in our traditional system just justifying why we took off points, right? And uh, so that's that's no fun either. Okay, okay, it was wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go on. We did this one. So what I want you to do is to get a new gestalt. And this picture might look familiar to some of you, depending on how you look at it. It's either a, um, a Victorian woman doing her uh, toilette in front of a mirror, or it's a skull. Um, so you know it's. Uh, Quite a difference, quite a difference. And so for you, it's for all of you folks, you all become disenchanted with our current grading system. So trying on specs grading for size, which you might've already done, uh, is not going to be a big stretch for you. But I do want to describe specs, uh, specs grading uh, as, as having three components. But again, uh, you can mix and match these in different ways, and you can also mix it with traditional grading if you, if you choose to do that. So what I want you to do is, you know, get your, get your right brain going. And I want you to imagine grading all assignments and tests, satisfactory, unsatisfactory, pass, fail, and students will earn all the points or credit, I'm gonna to try to talk you out of points later on, associated with a piece of work or none of them, all or none, depending on whether their work meets the specifications that you laid out for it. And you should think of the specs as a one level rubric and that's it. But don't think of them as defining you know, C work, C minus, D work, uh-uh. Rather, imagine that they define satisfactory as at least B-level work. Some people have taken it to A-level work, and that's often what mastery grading will do, um, or I should say standards-based grading. So this, this is, this, but keeping it at at least a B, this is where you establish rigor or high academic standards. And the same thing, tests, well, Students have to get at least 80% to pass the test. Now, these specs might be as simple as completeness. For instance, you know, all the questions are answered, 
or all the problems are attempted in good faith or the work satisfies the assignment that is follows directions, which many students do not do very well, uh, or and also meets the required length if this is a, a written sort of thing. Um, but, you know, it could be in computer science where, you know, can't exceed so many lines of code and this sort of thing. So anyway, there is a there is a re required length because for students who are writing anyway, length means depth, right? So they can't just take the easy way out and write a sentence and that's okay. Um, the specs might be more complex. For instance, the description of the characteristics of a good literature review, or the contents of each section of a proposal, or the organization, section by section, perhaps paragraph by paragraph of the type of paper or report that you've assigned. Now, the whole thing is, you've got to be very careful in writing these specs. They have to be very clear. They have to have uh, enough detail so that students know what you're talking about. Um, and, but these are, these are, this is a, a sort of task that you can do before the semester starts. So you're not cramming so much in the semester because once you, you know, you're, you're grading on these specs, grading goes pretty quickly, pretty quickly. But in any case, these specs, must describe exactly the features of the work that you're going to look for. And in fact, I argue that most of our assignments, at least at the undergraduate level, follow a formula or a template. These are things that our students can do if they put their mind to it. All you have to do is lay out that formula or whatever parts of the formula is important for your students to learn and follow. So let's say if the assignment is a literature review, a good literature review, you're not expecting them, you're not setting specs that define a good literature review for experienced professionals, right? Like the kind of things that we write when we publish a paper. All right. Um, now, I'm going to, by the way, tell you, give you some examples in a little while. And if you're wondering, well, how in the world do I get to these specs? If you're grading on a rubric, what you want to do is look at the start with the top level of that rubric and then maybe look at some things in the next level as well. That's a, an, a, an easy way to do the conversion. Um, now, if you want and, you know, don't throw tomatoes if you don't like this idea, the specs may include the requirement that the work be submitted on time. But this is at your discretion. This is whether, you know, to the extent that you care about this sort of thing or that it's important. So in any case, complete, satisfactory, and maybe on time work receives full credit and incomplete, unsatisfactory, or at your discretion, late work receives no credit or no points and may be returned to the student for them to revise. This too is at your discretion. Now, for the students, it's all or nothing in terms of the credit or the points. Uh, in terms of the grade, there is no sliding by, there's no blowing off the directions, and there's no betting on uh, partial credit for sloppy last minute work. There is no partial credit in specs grading. And, you know, people say, oh, this is horrible. Well, well, wait a minute, you know, we get to the second element. But I do want to point out one thing. We have been so interested in making assignments that are tiny and small, but they don't count for much of anything. So they don't count for much of anything in the students' minds either. So, you know, it's okay if it's like a strictly a learning exercise, but not if we're doing assessment. If we're doing assessment, it should count for something. It should count for something. And then if it does, students will pay attention to it. Anyway, um, research documents, and this is some of the research that, that does the documentation. It documents that with this type of grading, student motivation is higher 
and students produce higher quality work. It's just the way things is. Every single one of these versions of uh, specs grading will, will do this. So there has been some quite a bit of evidence and not to mention the evidence that's in my book. So it's, but it, and it's not just in my book. So anyway, um, and we'll give you some examples, some very uh, of specs. They can be so simple. These have to do with sort of everyday reading assignments, for instance. Uh, and these happen to come from uh, business, but they can come from anywhere. In your own words, summarize the most important points of the assigned article in about 10 sentences. Okay, so there's your, there's your length limit, but just summarize what the most important points. Uh, after reading whatever assigned article, uh, pick out five new concepts that you learned and describe them in your own words. Pretty straightforward, but it does say five concepts. Uh, here's another one. Choose two items that interest you at such and such a website and briefly describe the impact they might have on business, but it could be on the environment or any kind of things. And finally, another example, read another article at this website and summarize what you learned in five to eight sentences. These are like super simple. And if you're ever worried about your students not quite understanding your specs, show the models. Show the models of this is what you're looking for, the kind of work you're looking for. Okay, you see there are five concepts here and they're defined in students' own words. Uh, and, uh, you know, and show them examples of this is not acceptable. Not all five, there aren't all five concepts. Uh, they are, the, the directions aren't followed, uh, things like that. Uh, that and students will catch on to this. And again, because this counts for something, this counts for credit, students are paying attention. You have their attention. Okay, let's, let me give you another example. And this is an example in your handout, the very first page of your handout, it just looks like this, just a bunch of type. And it says specifications for the individual reflective report. And it's actually from a course uh, from the School of Mechanical Aerospace and Civil Engineering on managing a uh, project management of humanitarian aid. So these examples, uh, these, this example gives, it's really lays out a semester long assignment in seven parts across uh, through the semester. And all they are this, they, they say task one, like it says introduction, 100 to 200 words. And there are three questions for students to answer. All they've got to do is answer these three questions in 100 to 200 words. Hey, no problem. Uh, this is the formula. This is what the instructor is looking for. The second task, a little longer, 400 to 600 words. And if you look at these questions, they are, at least in the, the first half of the semester, it's all about the student's experience working on a team, working with others. And this is an important part of project management, right? And so this is what, this is, it's, 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 some of it's introspective, some of it's observational, but in any case, students are supposed to answer all of these questions. And then later in the semester, it gets more to, uh, the, the questions address more on the management of the, pro the uh, project itself. But they're just a list of questions that students have to answer at different times, by different times uh, during the semester. That's all it is. These are the specs no sweat. Okay. So, um, and again, you know, students might need beginnings and models, maybe for, again, the first assignment that's, uh, that's done like that, that, that you're grading like this. And I have found, and other people also found that when you are grading these and you, let's say you find a spec that is missing, or maybe two specs are missing, or three specs are missing, or maybe they're all there, doesn't matter. Any feedback that you give students, aside from like, you missed this, this, and this, 
uh, students pay attention to it. They don't look at your comments anymore as justification for the grade. They look at your comments as you're trying to help them learn. Isn't that wonderful? So students will, will pay a lot more attention to your comments. Okay. Okay, so let's look at to the second element. This was the first element, pass fail grading with assignments and tests. The second element is tokens. These are virtual tokens. Uh, I'm not saying that you should, you know, go out and buy a bunch of physical objects and then give them out to your students. Uh, then if you do that, there will be a black market <laughs> in your course. And, and you certainly don't want that. So let's look at tokens. Uh, this is, by the way, this will go into any course if you if you like this concept, and I can't imagine why you wouldn't. Um, so imagine this pass fail grading system with this virtual token system where students start this, this semester with one, two, three, or more virtual tokens. This is your economy. I've seen courses have as many as five tokens. Uh, but anyway, but it's all your choice. And they, students can use a token or exchange it, if you will. And of course, you're keeping track of this uh, for a 24 hour extension on an assignment or a chance to revise an unsatisfactory assignment or a chance to take a makeup exam that they, that they didn't pass. Um, now, if you're into you know, attendance or anything, you can have a token you know, be an absence that doesn't count against them. This way, you're not listening to excuses. You don't care why why they need an extension. You don't care why, why they're absent. They're just using a token and that's fine. Uh, and so tokens are designed to buffer the riskiness of no partial credit and to give students second chances and a little bit of flexibility as well. Um, and of course, students who attend class regularly and submit their their work on time, take tests on time, uh, and submit satisfactory work the first time, won't have to use their tokens. And by the way, students like to hog their tokens. All of a sudden, they want life insurance, you know? <laughs> they are, they're, they're thinking like middle-aged people. And uh, so they don't like to use their tokens. If they have to, they will. So it, they're there. Um, now, at your discretion, because this is your economy, you can uh, give students opportunities to earn tokens as well, perhaps by submitting uh, satisfactory work early or doing an additional assignment uh, or maybe having perfect attendance all semester. I mean, whatever, whatever meaningful to you. And you might be able to put together a system where students can exchange so many tokens for something good. Uh, maybe not taking the final exam, although I'm not quite sure if that's you know, good for learning. But in any case, I think you're getting the idea. Or maybe uh, you know, getting a gift certificate for a pizza. It won't set you back too badly. So, um, at, but this, you know, maybe getting more points. But again, I'm not hot on point systems, and I'm going to try to talk you out of it. So anyway, tokens are a pretty non controversial element to, um, to specs grading. But I really think it, it's important. If you're going to grade that pass fail, please have tokens, I beg of you. Um, give, students, uh, give students a little bit of flexibility and, um, and, and just leeway. OK, so those are elements one and two. All right, now, OK, so now you're going to do something. You've got a job to do. So what I want you to do is select a graded assignment that you give either to students individually or students in groups and to convert your directions or grading rubrics into specs for pass fail grading. So I want you to take two minutes max. And then what I want you to do is type into the chat, not what your specs are, but how the task felt how the task felt to you. So give it a whirl.
Hey, that's been a minute, by the way. Just letting you know. Specs are one level rubric, one level, not four or five. Some people are finding this difficult. By the way, we're coming into the end of two minutes. Yeah, really made me think about the purpose of an assignment. Yeah, that's what it was doing for me too. Ooh, challenging and stressful. Other people find it easy. Interesting. Flying blind. Oh, goodness. Clarifying. Okay. Okay. Yours are easy. The reactions are all over the map yeah it's yeah what do you really want to measure i mean you really you really have to go into yourself and think about what you're doing in assessment well remember, you're thinking about pass fail that's stressful but remember you've got tokens you've got tokens for the students Yeah, somebody said I use rubrics for everything. Um, I have talked to a lot of faculty and a lot of them that don't find um, rubrics don't save them time. Rubrics don't save them time at all. And they find them hard to use and students don't understand them. What does solve mean? Oh, no. okay. Yes, it's easier when the task is procedural. But bigger things like problem solving or 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 efficiency, um, not quite. I think that that might depend upon the area. But uh, again, you might be looking at, and you've put this in your specs, setting up the problem correctly. You don't care what you know what arithmetic they might do along the way but setting up the problem correctly. Choosing the right alg algorithm might be the bottom line for you. Oh yeah, when well, you're doing grading an AP exam, you're stuck with their procedures. Okay, things have slowed slow down so let's go back to the presentation but it's interesting the wide range of reactions the wide range of feelings that you were going through while doing this task because some of you found it very challenging and some of you found it really quite easy so you know and experience of course makes a uh, a huge difference but you know that the first time that you do this this is not what you're going to live with for the rest of your life you're going to get better and better at this each time you set out a number of specs in fact something that i learned to do is i would do a list of specs and then i would look at it the next day or day after that and that that made a big difference because my subconscious was working on it I guess not while I was sleeping or eating or something. So uh, that can really help. Okay, let's go to the, oops, sorry. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so how do you wind up with final letter grades? Um, I'm going to, again, I'm going to 
try to try to talk you out of points by offering you an alternative. And the thing with this alternative, uh, these bundles or modules with the point system, yeah, each pass test or assignment is, is worth so many points, all or nothing. And then you just, you know, total up the number of points at, at the end, and then you get A's, B's, and C's, and D's out of that, okay? But let me tell you about bundles. Some people call them modules because it simplifies your grading structure further. It links grades to outcomes, or it certainly gives you that option to do that. It re reduces your grading time, and it allows students to choose their own grade, which includes the workload that they're willing to shoulder in your course. So I want you to think about, again, this, you know, this pass-fail grading system and the tokens, and put it together with each student's freedom to choose the final grade that he or she wants to earn. The student's not gonna tell you, it's just the student gets what the student winds up with, but at least students will have ideas in mind. Okay. Each course grade is based on the students completing one or more bundles or modules of assignments and tests at satisfactory level. Uh, higher course grades require more work, that is more hurdles, uh, and or more challenging work, higher hurdles, more complex or higher level content and or skills. Uh, that is demonstrating these or demonstrating both. And you're going to see examples later on of different kinds of bundles. Okay, so let's say, for instance, you set up 10 major assignments and tests might be written work, problem sets, uh, programs, designs, multimedia presentation, or some combination of these, whatever. Each assignment or test may have one or two companion or related assignments that, that somehow enhance the learning value of the assignment or the test. It can be a self-regulated learning exercise, um, a written reflection, a written self-assessment, a study plan for the next test or something else. Okay, oops, sorry about this. Um, so something else that that you know that make that, that, that adds to the learning of the assignment or makes students aware of what they are learning in the assignment or or the test. Uh, in addition, you can associate each bundle with one or more learning outcomes. So completing a given bundle means achieving a certain outcome or usually a set of outcomes. So anyway, so this is what this is what the 10 bundle model would look like. You number 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 each bundle according to the challenge level so that the lower numbers designate relatively easy and lower level thinking assignments and the higher numbers designate increasingly demanding and higher level thinking assignments such as those involving evaluation and creation. So you've got 10 bundles in the course for a D. Students have to successfully complete bundles one through five. For a C, bundles one through seven. For a B, bundles one through eight. And for an A, all 10 bundles. Successfully. Okay, successfully. Now, you might want an even simpler system, and there is a simpler system. You develop only four bundles of related assignments and tests, ranging from relatively easy and basic to very challenging. And the more challenging bundles of assignments and, and tests will require students to demonstrate broader knowledge and skills and or higher levels of thinking, achieving one or more learning outcomes. So for a D, students have to complete only the easiest and most basic bundle. For a C, yeah, they have to complete that one, that bundle, and another more challenging one. For a B, they have to complete successfully these two bundles, and an even more challenging third one. And for an A, they have to complete all four bundles, where the fourth is the most challenging one of all. So again, to be complete, 
all the students work within the bundle has to meet your specifications for satisfactory work. But as long as it does, it gets credit. And this means that you can, with respect to creative assignments, you can specify some basic parameters and not worry about grading them, which makes it really, really difficult. It's very, very difficult to do that. But you're gonna see an example of this, what I mean by parameters in, in a few minutes. Now, this setup allows students to choose their grade on the basis of their motivation, their time available, their needs, grading needs, and their commitment. So if a student chooses a C because that's all he or she needs in your course, you can respect that. It's not like the student didn't do well or didn't care because we will tend, I, and I think it's very hard for us not to do this. We will tend to look down at students who get C's, right? Why in the world did you get a C? Why couldn't you get an A? Well, not with this system. You say, okay, this person wanted to see, you know what? For whatever reason, that's fine with me. They made their choice. They had their, they had their reasons. Um, now, if you happen to be in a, to be teaching a course that have that has a list of outcomes that students must reach then you have to have all those outcomes built in to a C grade. And then the A's and B's are then going beyond those outcomes. And this is a reason why I'm not really, really thrilled with um, what the accrediting agencies put out because, oh, you're supposed to meet all these outcomes, you're supposed to achieve all of these. Well, maybe A students will achieve them all, maybe. But you can't tell me that the students who get B's and C's and D's in the course are achieving very many of them at all. Hi, Linda, I'm very sorry to interrupt you. I think that your screen share may have frozen. Um, <gasps> oh, really? And, and so we haven't seen a bundle slide. Oh, you haven't seen? Gee, I've been seeing them. Uh, should I go back and refresh or go back to it? You might stop the screen share and, and start it again. OK, wait a minute. Here. All right, start it again. Oh, like like actually like go back. Let's see if this works. Can you see this? That we can see, uh, yes, thank you. Okay, wonderful, terrific. Okay, this was the 10 bundle model. Okay, and as I was describing, and this, thank you for letting me know. I never would have known, I'm seeing it. Uh, so anyway, so this is this is the four bundle model. So anyway, um, so students, uh, students might need, some students are gonna need some encouragement to go for the B or the A, maybe students who don't believe in themselves, maybe uh, students who feel that they are underprepared, students who are first generation, uh, students who came from some pretty poor high schools. These students need encouragement. Tell them, yeah, you can go for the A or the B. It's all laid out for you. Try it. Now, usually you'll get the same sort of grade distribution anyway, although some people, have, and this is, these are the final grades, final course grades. Some people have found that there are a few more A's. And you know what? Isn't that wonderful? Because you've got their achievement to back up those A's those A's. So anyway, so certainly the way we read right now tells you almost nothing. So what I want you to do is look at some examples. Again, these are in your handouts of different courses. Uh, what you find on page three, so this is right after the specs for the individual reflective report. There's an illustrate. The first one is illustration of grading only on more hurdles. That is more knowledge and skills. It's a science course. It's from plant pathology. So you see students earn a C for uh, just having an average score of, of 70% or higher on the objective exams. Uh, and you know students don't learn that much, but hey, that's okay. It shows what they will learn. 
with a C, they have to master six, six different plants in, in detail. And uh, for an A, they have to master six more. So here we're talking about knowledge on the same level, but, um, but more knowledge having to do with more things. Okay, grading on only on higher hurdles. That's the next one. This is from a computer science course. Uh, in any case, students are have to do six assignments through the semester. But uh, for a C, students have to successfully complete only the easiest six assignments. For a B, an intermediate set of six assignments. And for an A, the six most difficult assignments. But either way you cut it, it's six assignments. Unless, of course, in this particular framework, um, that students are submitting uh, the assignments late, and then students have to do more assignments. And believe me, this guy left did not get people handing in late assignments because they didn't want to do more work. So that's an interesting variation on, you know, docking points or any of that nonsense. Oops, sorry about this. The next uh, illustration, uh, page four, is uh, a, a, a illustration of grading on both more and higher hurdles. So both of them. So, and if you see this framework, this is from uh, physiological psychology, advanced physiological psychology. Um, and so there is more work, but uh, also more sophisticated work for the higher grades. But I wanna turn your attention to the final project for students. Now, again, only A's and, and B students will be doing this, but uh, this the requirement is that the students do this assignment it's some through some creative means. And so what are what did, what did I mean by parameters? Now there gets a little bit more specific in the actual assignment directions. But for instance, what a novel modality, a half an hour video documentary, a series of public uh, uh, TV commercials that happen to be like six of them, a set of informational brochures, six of those or a research proposal requesting funding, uh, or team project, you could, see, could, you could do this as an individual or a team. A team project would be stating, uh, staging a uh, well-documented debate or an educational play of a half an hour. That's what I mean by parameters. And she didn't demand much more in terms of parameters. Now, hypothetical illustration on page five of more and higher hurdles um, using a hierarchy, the Bloom's hierarchy of cognitive operations, you can see that the, the for the D or, well, a D in the course, uh, really basic knowledge and comprehension of 70% of the material. For a C, knowledge and comprehension, uh, but, uh, but it's gotta be a little bit better than 70% of the material. For a B, there's also some work in addition to what's required for the C. There's also some work on um, that involves application analysis for the A. Also some work having to do with synthesis and evaluation. And then on the last page, not, excuse me, not the last page, but the next page, page six, there's a, this gets into more detail in terms of the outcomes that will be, will be realized for getting each, each grade. And this will stray, by the way, from Bloom's taxonomy. You don't have to use Bloom's taxonomy at all. So anyway, uh, you know, you if if you want, if, if some people say, well, can I just, you know, get you know, lay out, I don't know, ten bundles and have students choose, you know, if you want to, if you want a D, it's any five, and if you want to see it's any seven or whatever. Um, you can do that, but then you can't tie the grades to outcomes. So it depends on what's most important to you. So that's why I'm not really recommending doing that. I'm recommending uh, you know, putting the bundles in a, a hierarchy of difficulty. And then page seven and eight in the handout is also, it comes, comes right from my book. It's ways to make the transition from traditional grading to specs grading and to the different parts of grading and, and what exactly to do. So uh, I just want to, I, I want to leave enough time for um, 
uh, question and answers. People always have questions on specs grading, a lot of them. Um, some of them come out, you know, like some people come out like angry, but there's no reason to be angry. You can, again, you can use different parts of this this uh, this framework, but please, if you're going to use pass fail, please, please, please use tokens. Okay, you can have synthetic or hybrid models, which means you can combine traditional grading with uh, specs grading. For this this example, for instance, only uses specs grading for Bs and uh, for As and Bs. Okay, uh, the, the next one, uh, you know, it uses uh, specs. This this one. Uh, Use the specs grading only for uh, the A. Um, at, well, excuse me for the for the for the C and the B, but for the A, then we get into traditional grading. And then the third one, uh, the uh, C requirements uh, are traditional grading. The B and A's uh, go for a well. The B's are strictly a specs grading, and the A's are partial specs partial traditional so uh, and then there's for blended or online courses this is simply an example of what you could do in in an or in a remote class or you know whatever you want to call your version of an online class whatever it might be and so this is just an example of the way you can again you know mix and match uh and uh you know have uh you use traditional com combination of traditional and specs grading. So anyway, and this, by the way, is just the faculty that I know of who are using specs grading at these different institutions. Uh, so they're, you know, it's it, it's not fringy anymore. And your institute, you might be using specs grading and your institution isn't up there. Well, I just haven't heard about it yet. So but these are the ones that I have I have heard about. And you'll notice that there are all kinds of institutions in it, public and private and, you know, selective and non-selective community colleges, state colleges, all different kinds, all different kinds. So um, just letting you know that it can work at all different kinds of institutions. So hopefully I am allowing you folks enough time to ask questions. And so I'm going to go back to this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I didn't know that anybody was attacking anybody, but okay. <laughs> oh, you see Irvine. Okay. Glad to hear that. Glad to hear that. College of Charleston. Thank you. Thank you. You see Irvine. Okay. Okay, I will add those onto the list because I just add them on as I hear about them or find out about them or people, Loyola University, good Maryland, okay. University in Maryland, okay. Terrific, terrific. Oh my gosh, all kinds of places. Wow, South Seattle, Brandeis, no kidding. St. Edwards, Boston. Well, I'm just behind the times. This is wonderful. Thompson Rivers. Oh, I was there. What a beautiful place. Okay. Brigham Young, BYU. Okay. University of Illinois, Urbana. All right. Virginia Commonwealth. Hooray. Georgia State. No kidding. Just down the road. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, St. Louis. Wow. Pomona, Cal Poly. Oh, my. Well, this is great. Okay. But I do want you to think about questions that you have to ask because. Yes, uh, Sorry, sorry to interrupt, Linda. I have uh, some questions that have been submitted through the Q and A. Oh, feature. the Q and A. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. I'll go ahead okay. and read those off to you. I'll. Uh, we have about fifteen minutes left, so uh, we should be able okay. to get into some of these. Uh, let me uh, pick one from Andy Bixler. It says, "Imagine grading a paper with 
X number of specifications attached to it. And satisfactory is defined as meeting at least X minus one specs. If a student messes up two specs, do you stop grading? Do you stop writing comments? Would they know whether they messed up the rest of the specs? And does the answer change if revisions are allowed? Okay, uh, yes, I'm, ass I'm assuming revisions are allowed, but it's the student's choice as to whether they wanna revise that or not, right? I mean, it really is. And so I would I would keep going if I were you. I would keep going. And uh, so, yeah, I just, I, I don't know. I, I, guess, I guess if you're a lazy sort that you could just, you know, all right, Mr. Speck, that's the end of this, you know, I'm just gonna hand it back. No, no, no. Um, I would say, you know, provide some feedback if you can and uh, keep going through the rest of the paper so they understand exactly what they missed. And then if they choose to revise it, they might just say, oh my God, I missed nine out of the 10 specs. You know, forget it. I'm not gonna do that. It's too much work. I can still get a C, I'll be happy. And that's a student's choice. That's a, so I want, I want you to honor those, those choices. But I know there was a part of the question that, I'm not answering, but maybe I should go here, this one. Yeah, uh, okay, I'm, I'm not finding this one. Can, uh, Robert, can you, can you say what part of the question I missed? Because I think I missed a part of it. Um, so I think you had actually addressed almost all parts of this. Oh, question. okay, okay, many, maybe uh, I did. Okay, they, they okay. were asking about if okay. a student has if to miss a certain number of specs, early. But, yeah, and but misses it by one or two, yeah. you stop grading. Do you stop writing? Okay, okay, great, great, wonderful. Okay, okay. Yeah, Andy says uh, you got them all. So great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, another question uh, was asked by Jay Elzinger. Uh, can you describe the difference between specs grading and standards-based grading? I'm still not really sure about the differences, and is that described in your book? Okay. Um, standards-based grading, as I understand it, and I don't, you know, I don't remember if I talk about standards-based grading in my book. I really, really don't. I don't think I do. Um, but in any case, standards-based grading, grading, as I understand it, is you will, you, you, Mm -hmm. There's an unlimited number of redos to any assignment. In other words, it's sort of like giving them maybe like 20 tokens or something like that, but an unlimited number of re redos until they get it right. Versus specs grading, you have a you have a number of tokens. And yeah, I mean, if you want to use if you've got three tokens and you want to use all three tokens on well, because you keep getting something wrong again and again and again, but normally spec screening is, it's clear what your, what the, that's the paper, the problem set, whatever, what it's missing. And so you fix that, right? You fix it. You fix it on the first time because again, you don't want to get rid of all your tokens on one thing. Um, you want to save them for rainy days. Uh, you want them for insurance. So that's a, that's a big difference on limited redos versus like limited redos. Uh, and you know, if you've got one, if you've got one chance to do a redo because you don't want to blow all your tokens in one place, uh, get your faculty members help to figure out exactly how you're going to improve on this. And there may or may not have been that, that kind of uh, feedback given to you. So, but you want to get that kind of feedback so you don't blow all your tokens in one place. So I think that's a big difference. And it also saves you problems because you don't have to grade something four times. Great, uh, here's another question from an anonymous uh, person in the audience. It says, if I don't assign points, then every assignment looks like it is of equal importance. How can I indicate that they students will spend more time and learn more with this assignment than that assignment. Okay, some people I've heard of this this going on and it it makes a lot of sense. Some people will actually specify uh, how long you should spend on an assignment, and so you know that's that gives them some some sort of direction. But normally. 
the more in, quote important assignments are longer assignments, right? And that tells, again, for students, length means depth, and it can also mean importance. But uh, yeah, no, it, they all are important. Although oftentimes what some people have said, okay, they say, okay, you've got to do, and this is, by the way, there's an ex example of this in the, one of, the, uh, one of the, the bundle examples that I showed you, that you have to get, submit, what, 12 out of 14 little assignments, okay, for that A. Um, and so it can, and it can be any 12 out of the 14. So I, that sort of, I think, makes pretty clear that here we're talking about a bunch of, of small reading assignments versus that big assignment, that big project that students do at the end. Great. Here's a question from Carl Schaefer. He asks, what are some ways that you encourage students to shoot for higher grades? If a student walks in on day one and says, my goal is to get a C and I'm not even going to look at the bundles required for a B, what would you say to them? Okay. Uh, well, I, if I would say why, I would say why, what, why do you just want to go for a C? And, you know, the person might say, well, you know, your course isn't in my major or it's a it's a breath requirement and I could care less about it or I've got a full time job and I really don't have the time. That's fine. But again, I, I really want to. I don't want I want students to realize at least what their potential is. And I think what you should say, since we don't ask our students to do anything that they wouldn't be able to do that they need to know that everything we ask them to do is completely possible for them to do successfully. And just to build that confidence, if they, they choose not to do it, hey, you know, that's fine. But you can if you want to. All right, thanks. Uh, Mara has this question. Uh, there was an interesting point in the chat about how equitable earning tokens was. So what are your opinions on having students earn tokens versus giving them a set number to start with? Oh, I was, okay. I, uh, I would give them a set number to start with, period. <clears throat> I may or may not give them opportunities to earn more. Um, and, and, you know, because there's, and I would only give them an opportunity to earn more if there's some kind of reward at the end. You know, like in, let, let's say like if the, okay, so you start with three tokens. Now, if you can, you know, get two more, if you can, well, save all those three, if, if you can somehow wind up with five tokens, you can buy out of the final exam, if that's even legal in your school. Um, so that's, uh, that's all I, I always give them tokens. Don't make them have to earn all their tokens at all, at all. It's just an option. It's your economy, right? There's one from Andy uh, Bixler. Uh, you mentioned that specs, I'm sorry, you mentioned specs that require longer assignments for higher grades, assuming longer equals greater depth. But students are entirely capable of writing long papers that say almost nothing or contain incorrect information. Uh -huh. uh, you need more specs than just length. Oh, absolutely. No, I was saying uh, for uh, for just like everyday reading assignment or reading compliance assignments or reading comprehension assignments, those are just everyday sort of things because, you know, you, you might say, well, you want me to answer these two reflection questions and, you know, I don't know how much you, how much thinking you want into it, but uh, no, at, at a, a longer assignment, uh, you're going to have, you're probably going to have more specs, right? If it's a, if it's a, a meteor assignment. And so, but, you know, so you're giving some students some idea on how long you want it to be. So you might say, okay, I want it to be at least a thousand words. And, you know, an answer these six questions in at least a thousand words. Or, uh, you know, here's, here are the characteristics of a, good literature review, be sure you have these elements in your literature review. And 
keep your literature reviewed at somewhere between, I don't know, 800 and 1,000 words, something like that. So I don't, don't, uh, your le length, length is helpful for them. Length also can tell them, you know, for some people, it substitutes the amount of time that you should put into an assignment. Um, but, you know, it's it that uh, to set, leave that as like a bottom line, like here, answer the question in 50 words. Uh, that is just for those little little reading assignments or little everyday assignments. OK, another question. This one's from Carter Johnson. Uh, does bundle just <laughs> refer to bundling different achievement levels of various assessment types to each grade? That is some number of mastered objectives, passing assignments, or is it bundling content across the course? For example, in calculus, one bundle is derivatives and all the related assignments for derivatives, or in one bundle is integrals, et cetera. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, no, 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 no. Well, not if you not if you want them to learn both both integrals and 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 differentials and these other you know you want them to learn all these topics in a course no you do not bundle on content uh you you want to you want to you want to bundle on achievement okay uh, and you want to bundle on outcomes you know uh, that's that's sort of like the way to get your mind around it. I mean, and I'm assuming you do want students to show some competency in all these different areas like of math or all these different content areas. Yes, there was an example here uh, in um, uh, the examples of, of bundling that was strictly a content, you know, just grading on the amount of content that was mastered. You know, and that's just one example. But no, most most people, when they're doing this, will use both more hurdles and higher hurdles to determine their bundles. Most most people do. You see, like I, you know, I mean, I know from from math that you all have different. You know, you you start you give an, a, a a problem set, and you, they start with easy problems, right? Right. And then some of they get harder and harder and harder, right, as the problem set goes on. And, you know, students can maybe do the easy problems. And if they just do the easy problems successfully, that's, you know, in across all these different topics. Hey, they're going to get a C. If that's what they're going for. Um, if they're going for more sophisticated assignments or more sophisticated problems, they're going for a higher grade. Yeah, so. Okay, one last question and then we're gonna be uh, done here. We have so many other Q and A uh, items and a great chat happening over here. This okay. is from uh, Francesca. She says, I am working with bundles and I have different criteria in each bundle. What is your view on what to do when a student excels in one criterion on the bundle, maybe even to the A level, but on another criterion, they're so low, they might not even meet the C level. Mm -hmm. Oh. Uh -huh. First of all, hopefully you catch this early on and you talk to the student about it and you let the student know, uh, you know, this is where you're headed. OK, we don't want you to go there and you're helping them out. Uh, so but no, it, it, I mean, they can they can excel in one aspect and then blow it in another. And if they blow it, they blow it and they're not going to get as high a grade as they otherwise would get. But you really have to, you know, you got to watch how just with any kind of uh, any kind of course, you got to watch how people are doing. If you're seeing this kind of, you know, these disparate performance, you got to find out what's going on. I mean, if if you're if you're doing well, you know, in one aspect of calculus, you know, why would you blow it on another aspect of calculus, right? Or you know, if you're doing beautifully on logarithms. Why would you blow it on uh, differentials, differential equations? It, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, there might be a reason, but you got to find that out. Okay, well, on that note, uh, Linda, thank you so much again. Uh, thank you. Really, uh, the appreciation clap <laughs> uh, for 
uh -huh. some sort of emoji or something to uh, appreciate, uh, show our appreciation for Linda. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. And we'll look forward to uh, interacting with you some more uh, here at the rest of the conference. Oh yeah, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be around. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, just a couple of items in the chat. Uh, they kind of zoom past us in the chat here. Yeah. Uh, we do have uh, a, an updated link. Uh, Sharona or Kate, maybe you could hop on and say something about that. Yeah, we had to make a correction so that we didn't run into a cap limit on your book talk, <laughs> uh, Robert and Dave. So we have a new link. It is on the website. It should start with calstatela.zoom.us. So make sure you're going to the right link for 5C. Um, and it is, again, up on the website. Cross your fingers that we're going to make it through. <laughs> Okay, and with that, uh, I believe we have a break now and we'll see everyone back here at, what time are we coming back? In 15 minutes. 15 minutes, of course. Okay. I should know this by now, but I don't. <laughs> Thanks again, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. I just want to get this chat information. Well, we can probably send you a transcript of it. Oh, please do.